Just whilst we're setting up, I've just got a few announcements and logistical arrangements. Um, we'd like to, if you're enthusiastic, have a poster walk session this, up this evening. So that's going to start at six o'clock and you'll have, you'll be standing beside your poster with a little ring of enthusiastic people beside you. Uh, and you'll have a very strict three minutes to talk about your work. Um, and what we're hoping is that's a really good way, um, you know, in a symposium like this to kind of get your word out about, about your work. So um, we've got 10, 10 spots um, and that will start at six o'clock. So after this session, you can come and see me if you have a poster and you would like to join in the poster walk. Okay, transport. Um, the coach to Liverpool will be leaving at quarter to seven um, this evening. If you're staying, um, uh, if, if you, yeah, if you're staying for the conference dinner and you need to get back to Hooton train station or to the Premier Inn, then you also come and see me afterwards because we're going to arrange a couple of taxis, but we don't know um, how many people will need them yet. Tomorrow morning, the coach will leave LSTM at eight o'clock sharp, uh, and we return uh, after lunch about half one, quarter to two. Uh, again, if you want to leave from the Premier Inn tomorrow morning, you can see me. You won't be going back to the Premier Inn after the meeting. Okay? Any questions, please do. Okay, thank you, Emily. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Henk Schalk. I'm head of parasitology at the Royal Tropical Institute in Amsterdam. And I have the pleasure of uh, sharing this uh, after uh, lunch uh, session. I hope that your uh, brains are fueled to listen to some uh, interesting talks. And the first one will be by Professor Mark Pallen of uh, Warwick University, who has walked us through the landscape of diagnostic metagenomics. Okay, thank thank you. you. Well, thank you for the invitation to talk. Um, it's going to be a bit of a change from the previous uh, session. Uh, I meant uh, one of the uh, previous speakers mentioned horizon scanning. What I'm going to talk about is so far away on the horizon that you'll need a telescope to see it's a small little dot. Uh, and the interesting question is whether that dot's coming towards you very, very quickly or whether you, uh, you know, can take, it's going to take a leisurely approach. So the starting point for my talk is that uh, I'm a bacteriologist as well, I should claim, exclaim. I, I, so I'm in stra a strange land here among parasitologists. But we can talk some of the same language. So we're, we're, many of us are stuck in this problem of using 19th century techniques. So in bacteriology, the gram stain... Um, and the use of solid culture media go back uh, until the 1880s. And you kind of think, well, we're now well into the second decade of the 21st century, and could we not be doing something better than that? Now, obviously, there are lots of um, PCR-based approaches and so forth, but I'm going to uh, take a perhaps more radical view. I'm going to draw on this new opportunity that we have, which is high-throughput sequencing, which has come in in the last five or so years. Um, and promises sequencing far faster and far cheaper than we could ever obtain with the old Sanger-style sequencing. And in that sense, it, it's a disruptive technology. It's just a complete game-changer. And so it's very interesting to look at the previous session where people were trying to look at technologies as if they were stable entities, whereas in this field, it's, it's just been absolutely astonishing over the last uh, few years how things have changed. There's been very lively competition between different platforms and improvements in terms of sequencing here, here is looking just at cost is, is actually outperformed Moore's law that we talk about for computers. Um, and it's, it's just seen this astonishing change here. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. I, I have rather fancifully suggested that we're heading to something we might call the sequencing singularity, where sequencing becomes so easy and so cheap too cheap to meter, that it will be your preferred way of doing it almost anything. Um, and, you know, people have, have encoded Shakespeare and in DNA and things like that and then sequenced it back again to, you know, there are all sorts of weird things that you might do with sequencing, including diagnostics that you wouldn't think of now. Um, if this uh, Hypermore's law continues. Now, I'm very close to Liverpool and uh, we're talking very close to Liverpool at the moment, so I have to actually admit that there is an alternative view held by Neil Hall of Liverpool, which is that the gold rush will soon be over and we must not expect sequencing to get cheaper and easier um, and we've actually got to start thinking about biology and stop just continually chasing this, uh, this, this, this wave of opportunity. Um, I bet £50, £500 maybe that, that 
it's going to get quicker and cheaper. Maybe not five thousand, um, but but uh, you know we'll have to see, and, and only the next few years will tell us the truth about that one. But one interesting point uh, I heard the same things I heard before about uh, you know tricorders and whatever. Well, one technology to watch uh, is this one from Oxford Nanopore, which is um, on the horizon um, uh, and very closely on the horizon, where you have a USB stick and you pipette your sample into the stick and DNA sequences come off the stick onto your computer in real time. Um, I have to say that there's, it's been on the horizon for quite a long time and some people are calling it vaporware, but it, I think it will, uh, we'll see something in the next year or so. So what I uh, want to, to do now is actually take through a rather fanciful idea that we could just sequence <coughs> DNA extracted from samples as a way of making a diagnosis. So the term shotgun metagenomics is used to describe the direct sequencing of DNA extracted from a sample without culture, without amplification, without any capture. You just take the DNA out and sequence it. And we've kind of turned diagnostic metagenomics to say, well, if we do this on human or animal samples uh, to get a diagnosis, um, then um, it is a diagnostic procedure. So what does this mean? It means this is the traditional approach here. You take your sample, you turn it into colonies on a plate, and you pick those off and colony purify them, and then you go and sequence, and uh, after some time you end up with a sequence. Why can't we just go directly from the uh, sample uh, through to the DNA? Um, if we wanted to be a little rude, we would say this approach is called just sequence the shit uh, as, our, as our sort of slogan for the method. So the first example I'm going to give of this is some work we've done on uh, German sugar toxin producing E. coli, uh, which has been published. Um, and before I start with, on, on this, we'll have to just uh, explain a little bit about the background. So most of you will have heard that Germany was struck by a devastating outbreak of sugar toxin producing E. coli um, in 2011, in May and June. Um, this was due to the consumption of bean sprouts, uh, fenugreek seed uh, bean sprouts, um, and so some wag coined it the sprout break uh, as, as a name for it. There were more than 4,000 cases, over 40 deaths. You can see it's concentrated mainly in northern Germany, but uh, cases were reported from all over Germany, and in fact from many other European countries, including the UK, uh, associated with, usually associated with, tra with, with uh, travelers returning. There are very high risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome uh, with this infection, um, far more than is usual in these kind of cases. And for some reason, uh, females were particularly at risk as well in this particular outbreak. And that's not really been explained. Um, again, if we're going to be humorous, one, one, one answer might be that real men don't eat bean sprouts, um, but, but we don't know. So I, I got involved uh, with... Um, <coughs> A uh, guy working for me, biomedician working for me, uh, Nick Lohman, in uh, what we call crowdsourcing the genome. So we actually um, got involved in this activity. What happened was that the BGI sequenced the genome and released the genome into the public domain. Um, uh, Nick Lohman, working for me, assembled the genome. Uh, and then it was ass assigned to an existing lineage using a, a kind of a virtual MLST approach within five days of strain-specific diagnostic test release. And within a week, there were over 20 reports on the biology and evolution of the strain that have been filed on a, on a wiki. Um, and this is a bit of an old story. I'm just uh, providing it for context. But basically, we, 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 we called this uh, open source genomics because basically it involved rapid genome sequencing, uh, liberal approach to data release, and this iterative process where people were getting involved in doing the analyses. And most of the people, almost all of the people involved in the analyses were not professional uh, public health workers or professional microbiologists working in the public health setting. Uh, they were bioinformaticians who wanted to just do something useful. Anyway, this culminated in a paper in the New England Journal, and you can see us there celebrating with our German collaborators, who we'd not actually met uh, at the time the study was done. We, we did all this uh, uh, over the internet. So we went over to Hamburg and, and, and had some champagne with them. And then we said, well, what are we going to do now? How can, how can we actually uh, uh, top that? And they said, well, they had this, this freezer full of hundreds of stool samples from the outbreak. And I said, let's just sequence them, shall we? And let's just see what happens. Um, and maybe we can get 
the, the genome of this, uh, uh, this STEC out of the metagenome directly. So we did exactly that. We, we ran this on, the, on our sequence of the MySeq. And we generated um, a metagenome from one of the samples. And then uh, Nick Lohman aligned the reads from the um, metagenome against the reference genome, the known genome that we already had for the outbreak strain. So it's a little bit confusing. The coordinates along the bottom there are actually genome coordinates. Uh, and so you're seeing that this is the genome laid out along here. The, the cover, this, is, this is a depth of coverage. So we were achieving about 20-fold depth of coverage. So each position in the genome, there were about 20 reads that were covering that position. You can actually see that there's this little bit of a smile there, and that's um, typical of when you've got bacteria that are growing in log phase, because the sequences close to the origin of replication are overrepresented in the population. So that was an interesting finding, so telling us that these bacteria in that stool sample were at log phase when the, the sample was analyzed. Um, we also saw this little uptick here, uh, at the position where the sugar toxin encoding phage lies in the E. coli chromosome. And what we take that to mean is that we're actually not just detecting the stuff that's in the chromosome, which is so-called prophage, where that bacteriophage is integrated into the chromosome, but we're probably also detecting DNA from the free phage particles that are also present in the sample. We also achieved some kind of backwards compatibility in that there's a commonly used approach called MLST. It's a typing method in, in bacteriology, and we could actually read out the MLST profile from this metagenome. Um, and so we, we were very encouraged. We kind of cheated because this was a sample we knew had a very high uh, biomass of that E. coli in it, but we were very encouraged nonetheless. We then looked at a range of other samples. So they gave us some samples, that our German colleagues, they gave us a range of samples uh, from patients who were STEC positive, some that were high abundance uh, for the STEC, some medium, and some where they'd had the most difficulty actually finding any STEC at all. Um, they also sent us some samples from patients who had diarrhea at the time of the outbreak, but were found not to have STEC, but to have some other pathogen instead. And so you can see here we had a sample with C. difficile in, and we achieved not particularly high coverage, about one-fold coverage on average there. Um, uh, Campylobacter jujuni, similar kind of thing. The one in the middle there, Campylobacter concisus, was actually from a sample that was supposed to be Clostridium difficile positive, but the Campylobacter concisus reads were, uh, I think, about a hundredfold more abundant than the C. difficile reads. I'd never heard of a Campylobacter concisus before uh, we did this study, but it turns out that it is a so-called emerging diarrheal pathogen that has been described in association with diarrhea. So this was what you might call an unknown unknown. We weren't looking for this particularly, but nonetheless the metagenomics approach found it. Um, we also, on different E. coli samples, we got different amounts of coverage, but, and it, but in most of the cases there you can still see that over-representation of the sugar toxin encoding phage, but interestingly uh, at different ratios to the chromosome. And we tried to link that to see whether it was related to, say, disease severity or something like that, but we couldn't actually find any particular reason to account for that. So it's a, an interesting observation. Now, we tried to submit this to JAMA, uh, Journal of American Medical Association. They were having a, um, <coughs> having a, 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 a special genomics edition. Uh, which they advertised saying that they were looking for submissions for it. So we said, well, does genomics mean only the human genome or can we put in microbial genome stuff? And they said, yeah, you can put in microbial genome stuff. But in our initial discussions, they was like, hmm, this is underpowered because we only had 10 samples. Sensitivity was only, only two-thirds of samples were positive, so it was a lousy test. Um, and the reviewers, not so much the editor, but one of the reviewers, when it went out, it did go out for review, the, the first uh, draft, they said, well, we kind of cheated because we knew what the outbreak strain genome looked like. And all we did was we took the metagenome and we just aligned it against that that we knew. But what we should have done was put ourselves in the shoes of the people back in May and June when the outbreak was ongoing. They didn't have that genome. Could we have actually get that genome out of the metagenome de novo without having to, uh, to use that trick? And so we realized, well, we're not going to get this published in JAMA unless we think rethink the way we're, we're doing things. So we'll go deeper in terms of our sequencing and, and, we'll, and, and in terms of how many samples we look at and we'll have to work a bit smarter. 
So we called Illumina, who we, we know the people in research and development um, fairly well, uh, and in particular this guy Jeff Smith, um, who in fact we'd recruited someone from Illumina into the lab recently just before this, and so we, we were on good terms with these guys, and we said, look, can you help us out, um, and can we have a high seek run? So we had a MySeq, which is a fairly low capacity instrument. Can we can we put this onto the state of the art HiSeq? And they said, well, actually, you can put it onto the HiSeq 2500, which is just being launched, and there's this rapid run mode. Um, and so we generated huge amounts of data. For one of them there, you can see one of the CDF positive samples. We generated uh, nearly 15 gigabytes uh, bases of of data, so five times the human genome equivalent data. Um, we also then sequenced another uh, 40 samples, so we ended up um, with a, a large collection of samples there uh, to look at. And when we looked again at these samples that didn't have E. coli but had other things in, we were getting fairly good results there. We managed to get C. difficile, uh, we managed to detect the toxin genes, and, and we actually managed to recover in, 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 with the high seq we got MLST data. Uh, one of the salmonella samples, we, we got so, uh, it didn't work on the MySeq, but it did when we went deeper on the HiSeq. The C. difficile I've already mentioned, we got Campylobacter concisus on the MySeq, but we then got the C. difficile and the Campylobacter concisus on the HiSeq. So this was all very encouraging, and, and Campylobacter. There was one that failed, one that was supposed to have salmonella in it, but we never found any salmonella, so we don't quite know what happened there. But... When we look at the whole, oh, this is just table taken out of the paper, but the, the takeaway message is that actually we still only were getting two thirds of our samples positive in terms of detecting the sugar toxin genes in the metagenome. Now, in our defense, we can, uh, we can say that actually this isn't a random set of samples from the outbreak. It deliberately had a third of the samples were the most difficult samples selected by our bacteriology colleagues in, in Hamburg. But nonetheless, it didn't look good, and uh, they were, I think they were called the start uh, criteria we were supposed to fulfill if we were talking about a diagnostic test, and as we are mere molecular bacteriologists, we just threw our hands up in horror and thought we're not going to be able to sell this as a test, it's lousy. People are going to say, 67% and you're spending thousands of pounds and using state-of-the-art techniques and only trained bioinformaticians can make this work, what's the point of that? So we, we had to go away and think, well, how... Can we re-ask the question? What question can we address? Um, and so instead of saying that we were going to use metagenomics to make the diagnosis in the individual case, we said, well, let's just say we, we had this outbreak, we had all these sick people, and we wanted to find out what the cause of the outbreak was. Could we do that? Um, and, and so we set ourselves that task. And uh, Nick Lohman, this is actually done at great speed because we got the, the comments back from the, from the journal, from the editor and the reviewers, and they, they gave, I think they gave us about a week to, or, or so to get their results back to them, a redrafted form. So Nick had to redo all the analyses. I had to redraft all the paper. But anyway, he did this, and what he did was he, he, he looked at the, um, he did an assembly of the whole metagenome, and then he looked at the, the assembled sequences and, and tried to look at the, the kind of taxonomic coverage, the taxonomic complexity. And he said, well, let's have a look at all the sequences that are present in at least two strains. Um, and this is what you get. It's just a huge mess of different bacterial uh, groups in there. Um, and so there was no way we were going to get a genome out of that. So then he said, well, actually, why don't we set ourselves a rule to say that we'll throw away all the sequences that are not present in at least half of the metagenomes that we have from these fecal samples. So, you know, if we've got an outbreak here, let's say that we have detected the thing in at least half the samples. So when he did that, things got an, a, a whole lot more um, simpler and less complex. But still, lots of different organisms in there. You can see the enterobacterioles where E. coli sits are actually now looking fairly prominent, but there are lots of Clostridiales still in there and all sorts of other things. So then... Um, Nick, as I say, had a very agile mind. He said, well, what he'll do is he'll then go to publicly available data sets to look at uh, metagenomes for normal people. So there have been a couple of studies. There's this human microbiome project in the US. There's something called MetaHit that's been done in, in Europe with uh, collaboration with BGI. So he subtracted out everything that was present in normal, uh, healthy individuals. And when he did that, uh, we ended up with uh, him basically subtracting out the genome of the outbreak strain pretty much. Um, 
In fact, he went. It actually goes a bit further than that because it subtracts out everything that's in all E. coli's, and so we were left with just the the so-called accessory genome, the strain-specific genome for this particular E. coli. He then did some special tricks, uh, which I won't go into, to actually recover the whole genome and manage to reconstruct the outbreak strain genome from the metagenome and actually recover some of the key virulence loci from the metagenome um, working in this kind of de novo fashion. So we were very pleased with that. That actually showed proof of principle that this technique may actually work. Now, that, that whole line of work was actually an example of, um, of just brute empiricism. Because if you sit in your armchair, you just said, well, it's not going to work because there's going to be too much human DNA in there. There's going to be all the food DNA in there. And E. coli is only a minor component of the genome, uh, of the metagenome of the, of the microbiome anyway. But we just did the experiment. I think it's John Hunter is famous for this quote that he has uh, from years ago saying, why think, why not do the experiment? Well, we've done that again in a second example um, where we've actually done some metagenomic analysis of lung tissue from a mummy. So to provide uh, some of the background, well, we actually uh, started speaking to some people who were interested in ancient, um, well, in, in, in the origins of disease in, uh, and, and the presence of disease pathogens in uh, ancient historical specimens. Um, and, and in fact, Helen Donoghue from UCL brought to my attention this paper where they'd actually sequenced this Iceman, Ertzi. Um, uh, they'd sequenced his genome, but effectively they'd sequenced a metagenome because there was all sorts of other bacteria and stuff in there. But they found within that those sequences uh, Borrelia burgdorferi sequences. So this was the first hint that actually you could do this on ancient material as well. So Helen Donoghue actually told us about this uh, crypt in, in Hungary, in, in the town of Vac, um, which contained 242 bodies which had um, been put into the crypt over a period of time. Over, I think the crypt was used for about 150 years and then sealed up in the middle of the 19th century and then only opened up again in 1994. And one of those mummified bodies belonged to a, a, a young lady called Terezia Hausmann who died on Christmas Day in 1797 at the age of 28. Now, they did some, um, the guy Mark Spiegelman, I think, was involved uh, mostly in, in trying to achieve a diagnosis, a cause of death for these individuals. And they took x-rays and, and various other things. In her case, the x-ray was clear, but she did appear to be cachectic, which was consistent with tuberculosis. And if you ever look at the textbooks about tuberculosis, the uh, epidemiology is always the, the, it's coming down and coming down and coming down. I know in in UK, you know, well, it's just come back up again, but it's been going down ever since before antibiotics, before BCG. But this is probably the time when it was actually at its peak, and it, and it, it's it's a reasonable bet that these patients, these these individuals, did have tuberculosis anyway. But on one of the chest samples from Terezia Hausmann, they actually did some uh, limited genotypic. Uh, genotyping and, and, and PCR, quantitative PCR, and it suggested that there was good preservation of, of M. tuberculosis DNA in the sample. So that was, again, we worked on the principle, let's look at a, a sample that we have a good chance of getting a result on, uh, first of all. So we took some material from this uh, Terezia Hausmann. Um, this is a, a, a reconstruction of what she would have looked like at the, at the time of, um, of being deposited in the crypt that's on display in the museum uh, associated with the crypt. Anyway, we sequenced this on the on her, on her Illumina. It wasn't a particularly good run, about five and a half million reads. Um, and when those were mapped against uh, the um, H37RV genome, we did actually get quite... Uh, even coverage, we got about 38-fold coverage. And in fact, when we looked at the, what we'd, we, when we did that mapping, we could see parts of the genome in H37RV that were missing. And these indels that we saw were characteristic of, of what's known as the Harlem lineage, uh, particularly closely related to the so-called Erdmann strains, and, and a strain from Germany that caused, uh, associated with a recent outbreak there called 7199-99. The problem was um, that when, when the, the bioinformatician, Martin Sargent, tried to actually do some snip typing, he, he, he couldn't get much sense out of what he was looking at. And then he realized that actually what he had 
was he was using a pipeline that excluded SNPs um, that had less than 80% coverage in alignments. And when he removed that particular restriction, he suddenly, it, you know, he suddenly realized exactly what was going on. In fact, there were a number of SNPs, around 300 SNPs, that actually were present in about 50% of the reads, but not in the other 50%. So he suddenly realized that he actually had a mixed infection here. So there were two different genotypes mixed in together. And when he went through and looked at some of the regions of the genome, got this genome, fairly even coverage there, that big spike, I think it's probably the 16S. But then you've got a region there where there's no, there's nothing when you're, when you're mapping against H37RV. That's an indel in both of the strains that are present in this uh, sample. But in other samples, you get other parts of the, of the genome, the coverage suddenly just drops down to 50% for that particular region. So we got this story from two different uh, sources of information. So we conclude that, that she's, she was suffering from a mixed infection with these two different genotypes. And interestingly, the, the previous spolygotyping studies that have been done on these um, uh, mummified remains had identified two different genotypes in samples from the Hausman family. And I didn't know much about this. I looked at the literature, and it turns out that actually mixed infection seems to be fairly common in areas of high endemicity. I think there was a study in KwaZulu-Natal that suggested about 9 or 10% of patients actually have mixed uh, infections. Um, but both strains appear to be quite closely related to this Harlem lineage and to particularly the 7199-99 um, strain. We've done a little bit more on this. Uh, we've actually done four runs now. Um, run two, we, we did a, a second sample from the same patient. And this time it worked a lot better. And we used a different kit as well. And we ended up getting 550 fold coverage of, the, of that metagenome, uh, of that genome from the metagenome. And now the SNPs, which we initially had judged were about 50 50, were actually. 45, 55. So we now have a chance of actually binning those SNPs so that we can actually associate each SNP with a particular um, a genome, and, and that works on, underway at the moment. Another body that we looked at as a male, we, we looked at some bone scrapings, and here we, we got much less uh, promising results, but nonetheless, there it does appear to be some H37RV related mapping uh, uh, sequences in there, some sequences that really are. Um, indicative of M tuberculosis mixed in with some other mycobacteria which are probably grown post-mortem uh, on that sample. And just yesterday I heard that on the fourth round we've also got some fairly uh, promising results on another sample from the mother of Tourette'sia Hausman. So in conclusion we've shown that diagnostic metagenomics can be used to identify a bacterial outbreak strain from faecal samples and in that process we identified several other bacterial uh, pathogens, including some unknown unknowns, things we weren't expecting to find. We've also recovered uh, a mixture of genomes from 200-year-old lung tissue. And so I would tentatively say that maybe we have something that is going to be an alternative to the, this Graham-Koch paradigm of, 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 of culture and, and microscopy. Obviously, there are some caveats. Our studies were retrospective. The lung tissue we, we knew, and in fact, the faecal samples we knew the ones that gave the best results were the ones we knew would give us the best results. Diagnostic metagenomics at the moment is orders of magnitude too expensive and too difficult for routine use. Um, and of course there is this issue that genotype might not always predict phenotype. Um, but nonetheless, we've, we're moving forward. Uh, just one last thing to add a parasitological uh, slant to this. We actually, as we were doing this, we were thinking we're really smart. We we're the only people that have ever done metagenomics on historical samples, and then two papers came out just before ours did. One on Egyptian mummies, where they claimed to have got some reads that mapped against uh, the Plasmodium falciparum genome and against the Toxoplasma gondii genome. They don't present any sequence data, and the sequence data from that paper is not in the public domain. I'm trying to get hold of it, so I, I'm still a bit sceptical. But a much... Uh, a uh, more credible paper actually recovered a leprosy genome from a tooth. Um, and so it's clear that this is a, a kind of happening technology. We've got plans to do lots more things, but I'm running out of time, so I won't actually uh, talk through all of those. I mean, one thing we are interested in is if we can look at some ancient Egyptian mummified remains, these uh, from a place called Fayum, where there are these wonderful portraits that go along with the mummies. That would be very exciting if we can do that. And I just have to acknowledge all the people that have done the work. Thank you. Thank you.
think we have time for one or two urgent questions. Stand aside. <laughs> well, in the back. Just in time for a question. Um, imagine learning, so you that well. What sort of depth and how many systems did you use for example? Well, when we first did it, we were using the MySeq, um, so we were getting a, f I don't know, a few million, two, three million um, reads. We um, then went to the, onto the HiSeq, and as I said, we, we was in some cases we were getting, uh, fit, well, in the, in the highest coverage was about 12 gigabases. Um, so we've generally, we've, we have our own MySeq and we use it, and we usually do one run per sample. And, and what we found was that that worked fairly well, um, but there were cases where it was giving us patchy coverage or no coverage, and then we went tenfold deeper on the high seek, um, and, and then we did achieve stuff. So this is where there is this issue of you know depth of coverage. Is this ever going to be used routinely? Um, one of the points raised by one of the reviewers, who I think was probably David Relman, is that actually although it does cost thousands of pounds and it's a difficult technology. If you were stuck with an outbreak and you did not know what was causing it, then this probably would be the most appropriate technology. Okay, thank you very okay. much for your contribution.